Welcome to Act Online, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. As we continue the conversation from our last episode, Dan Huger and Dylan Palman move the discussion forward on Acton Institute's vision for a free and virtuous society. We examine the Institute's 10 core principles, which serve as the bedrock of who we are and what we do. Namely, we seek to integrate religious truths with free market principles. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Welcome. My name is Dan Huger, Librarian and Research Associate with the Acton Institute. And today I'm joined by... Dylan Palman, a Research Fellow here at Acton and Executive Editor of the Journal of Markets and Morality. Today, Dylan and I are going to be sort of extending a conversation we had earlier. This is sort of the second of two parts. However, I think it'll, 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 stand, it'll stand alone freely as well. Um, the first was sort of a meditation on Acton's mission statement, which is that the Acton Institute is a think tank whose mission is to promote a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty and sustained by religious principles. And in that conversation, we talked a lot about the importance of religion and economics, why these two go together in the way um, in Acton's mission. And then um, what we're expanding that out into are uh, these core principles that are sort of like a general framework for that integration between religion and economics. These were core principles were thought up you know, years ago at the heady days at the uh, foundation of the Acton Institute, before Dylan and I were there. Um, and as I understand it, it was sort of like a real world sort of thing where it was a bunch of people, theologians, economists got together. And instead of hot tubs and like all the booze you could drink, it was all the religion and all the economics you could handle <laughs> and theorists going back and forth, hashing out these ideas. Uh, the Real World, for listeners who may not know, was a popular series in the 90s that was the first reality TV show, other than, I guess, Cops. Uh, but uh, Dan and I were simply teenagers who were watching The Real World rather than thinking about these ideas at the time. <laughs> Actually, yeah. not even teenagers when Acton was founded. We were like kindergartners. <laughs> yeah. So these principles... Um, Dylan, you've worked with these before. In your book, Foundations yes. of a Free and Virtuous Society, mm -hmm. you sort of lay out sort of an encapsulation of kind of what we do in the Acton University core curriculum. Mm -hmm. But in the back of that book, you included these core principles. What was, what was your thinking about why to include those and why those were important? Yeah, so my book uh, focuses on you know, three major components. We usually have four core lectures, but I kind of reduced it to three three key chapters of, you know, what is humanity before God? So more on a little bit of an individual religious basis than what is human society? Um, so what is our life together? Um, how do we think of that from a religious point of view? And specifically, because I am a, a Christian from a Christian point of view. Um, and then uh, lastly, what is an economy? You know, what is what is our work and what are, is the material world and how does that fit into uh, our place uh, as image bearers of God? Um, and in the course of that, however, I hit on all of these things. And then the, the last two chapters are actually looking at specific economic principles and why they're important and why it doesn't really work uh, to try to do things without them. Um, so I included this in the back because it's, it's such a great shorthand of just um, not not it's, it's not like a creed. It's not, um, you know, a set of dogma. Uh, what it is, or maybe actually dogma might be a good good uh, analogy, and I might have used that before. But it, it, what it is is it's these are like the tent posts of our big tent here at Acton. They are the, the things that bring us all together, whether participants or speakers or writers or anything like that. 
Um, it's why people come to Acton, why Acton does what it does, and also explains the, the diversity at Acton because there's all, all kinds of different people. We're an ecumenical organization. Some people come from all different Christian perspectives. We even, um, as you mentioned in our mission statement, we, we talk about religious principles. So we have um, a few monographs written from a Jewish perspective. We actually um, have one or two from an Islamic perspective as well. Um, and and I think we're open to really any any religion um, kind of mining their tradition um, to see to what extent uh, this is something they can contribute to as well. And we're we're not necessarily opposed to that. I mean, we we certainly, as Christians, care about our faith and care about the gospel. Um, but you know, just like the earliest Christians believed that the the logos of God, who is Christ, uh, had planted his seeds in all human civilization. Uh, we think that there are there are some fundamental truths to human life and society and existence and to uh, the good life, uh, to human flourishing uh, that can be found um, all over. And and everyone has a, a contribution to add and um, their own perspective on those things. So I included them for that reason, that it, it on the one hand, um, is a great little summary of what brings people together. Um, but it also kind of gives people, okay, these are the touch points that if I'm interested in acting and what acting does, um, some familiarity with these is, is is necessary to really get a sense of uh, acting's integration of faith and economics. So these are sort of guideposts. These are sort of um, touchstones. These are um, markers. Yeah. Um, and that that it's it's like that as opposed to sort of like a catechism where it's like these are the series of questions and these are our answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This mm -hmm. is more – these are the animated concerns. These are the animating questions. These are sort of some of the analytical tools we look through to, to think through things like public policy, to think through things like um, you know social crises, to mm -hmm. think of um, – think of the world and, and – uh, and to make sense of our place in it. Um, the first one, the most, the most important one, is where we begin with the dignity of the human person. Mm -hmm. And that's the human person is created in the image of God, is individually unique, rational, and su the subject of moral agency, and a sort of co-creator in the world. He possesses intrinsic value and dignity, implying cert both, both certain rights and duties for both himself and other persons. Uh, these truths about the dignity of the human person are known through revelation, but they're also discernible through reason. Mm -hmm. And this touches into a whole lot of aspects of our work. Mm -hmm. This is one of the places where natural law, which is one of those core lectures, gets integrated mm -hmm. in that a lot of these truths are knowable by human reason. How do you think through – the dignity of the human person and how it applies to um, the world today and, and, and our work at Acton. Yeah, so this is a, a principle that, you know, again, I think actually demonstrates this idea of the a broad appeal um, of Acton's principles. The human dignity is, according to the compendium of the social teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, the fundamental social principle of Roman Catholic social thought. Uh, but it's also something that you find in personalist philosophy, which which was, you know, spanned many traditions. Um, there's Orthodox thinkers, Protestant thinkers, Roman Catholic thinkers, and, and Jewish thinkers like Martin Buber, for example. Um, but also it's, it's rooted in, to some degree, um, Immanuel Kant's moral vision, his his categorical principle that uh, a human person as person uh, is something that cannot be treated as a means to some other end, but must be treated as an end in itself. Um, that Again, there's that inviolability of human dignity um, that should shape the way in which human beings treat one another and then as a corollary, um, how businesses treat people or how governments treat people or churches for that matter. Um, and we see the influence of this even on something like uh, the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, a lot of the, the drafters of that were significantly influenced by personalist philosophy. Um, and it's something that actually goes all the way back. This is one of the interesting things I've uh, discovered in my own research is there's um, 
a treatise on the resurrection by Athenagoras of Athens, or at least attributed to him, but probably comes from about the second century, in which he basically gives the exact same definition of a human person as an end in itself and not a mere means uh, in a defense of the resurrection, something that Kant, as far as I know, was not super interested in. But but otherwise, it follows a lot of the same same kind of logic. Um, so this goes all the way back, at least in the Christian tradition. And again, I think it has a, a universal appeal and it, it should ground our thinking about any of these other principles and about really everything we do, um, that every single person has value, dignity, and potential, um, that it is, it is a sin to uh, demean or degrade or to violate in any way. Lord Acton talks a lot about how this, this dignity of the human person and how, in particularly, this combination of rights and duties, this network of obligations and freedoms that we inhabit, um, should affect our political perspective. Um, and this is, this is just one of my, my – might be my favorite quote of Lord Acton when he talks about – there is a wide divergence and an irreconcilable disagreement between the political notions of the modern world and that which is essentially the system of the Catholic Church. It manifests itself particularly in, the con in, in their contradictory views of liberty and of the functions of the civil power. The Catholic notion, defining liberty not as the power of doing what we like, but, as, but the right of being able to do what we ought, denies that the general interests can supersede individual rights. It condemns, therefore, the theory of the ancient as well as the modern state. Mm. So it's a rejection of the sort of totalitarianism of the pharaohs, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the sort of universal human slavery and bondage that was prevalent through much of the ancient world, and also rejects the sort of totalitarian notions of the state that are common in all too many places of the world today. One of the things when we talk about rights and particularly obligations, these are obligations to each other. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of the second core principle at Acton, mm -hmm. which is on the social nature of the persons. That although persons find their ultimate fulfillment in communion with God, one essential aspect of their development – of the development of persons is in our social nature and capacity to act for disinterested ends. The person is fulfilled by interacting with other persons and by participating in moral goods. There, there are voluntary relations of exchange such as market transactions that realize economic value. These transactions may give rise to moral value as well. Uh, there's also voluntary mutual relations of dependence, such as promises, friendships, marriages, and the family. And those are moral goods too. Uh, these two may have other sorts of values, such as religious, economic, aesthetic, all of that as well. But this, this social, the, the nature of the person is socially embedded is also essential to thinking through these relations. Yes, yes. So there, there's um – Often maybe an uncharitable characterization of individualism as being this sort of atomistic idea that, you know, everyone can be Robinson Crusoe or whatever and just survive on your own on an island. Um, and there's been a lot of pushback to that historically. I, I think it's worth noting that any sort of distinction between individual and person is actually a 20th century distinction. So before that time, somebody used the term individual. They might mean exactly this. Um, but it's come to be a hallmark of personalist thought and a way of distinguishing persons from the mere atomistic individuals that uh, persons have relations, that you can't separate a person from the relations. So I'm not just a man. I am a son. I am a husband. I am a father. I am a neighbor. I am a friend. I am a worker. All, all of these things are descriptions of relationships that are a part of who I am. Um, and... In that sense, everyone is connected. Uh, the, one of my um, favorite philosophers is the Russian Orthodox philosopher uh, Vladimir Sloviev. And he says, you know, if you stripped away all of the relationships of dependence uh, that a person has, not only would you have – would they have no freedom, uh, you know, paradoxically, but they'd have no existence, right? You just – you can't get rid of this. Um, all the way, you know, from as simple as their parents all the way up to the state to some degree that, that – People are citizens as well, and that, that is a relational um, term uh, that comes to define who people are. So uh, this is incredibly important for thinking through these issues, not simply in 
you know, in an abstract way, but but thinking about the real world, uh, the the world in which we live, in which people are all of these things, and in which governments make policies that affect all of these things. And this is something that gets to the nature of um, sort of the formation of conscience. You know, conscience is that witness in yourself. Act and thinks thinking through conscience said this. He said, conscience, do I decide or the community? If I, there is no authority. If they, there is no liberty. Mm -hmm. Some mediator is wanted. Acton posits that as being the church, which sustains liberty and authority, Mm. which brings us then to our next, which is the importance of social institutions. Now, the church is more than a social institution, but it also acts in the world as a social institution. And social institutions are important because since persons are by nature social, various human persons develop these social institutions, the institutions of civil society, especially the family, are the primary sources of society's moral culture. These institutions are neither created by nor derive their legitimacy from the state. The state must respect their autonomy and provides the support necessary to ensure the free and orderly operation of all social institutions in their respective spheres. The Acton Institute itself is yes. a social Indeed. institution, yeah. which is designed towards a social purpose. What, what do you think of as, as, as our mission and social purpose, and, and, and how, does that, how does that fit with, with roles of other institutions that are all vital to maintaining a civil society? Yeah, so this is one reason why every chapter of my book begins with um, uh, Genesis, uh, usually basically just the Garden of Eden and what happened right afterwards. Um, and the idea being that there was already – human relationships in society before you have anything like a state or civilization. Um, And it is important to remember this idea of and to think about questions of human origin. You know, these theological, philosophical questions have a very practical impact on how you conceive of the role of the state vis-a-vis these other social institutions. So if the family pre-exists the state, then it has a certain priority. It is a society that already existed whose rights must be maintained and defended and protected by the state rather than the state usurping them, right, and trying to replace the family. Um, And that's true of religion. That's true of um, any sort of uh, economic cooperation to some degree or, you know, in the case of Acton, uh, you know, nonprofit associations, friendships, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. that's that's the the very simple way to put it. Although it's our, also our jobs, but yeah. <laughs> but we are friends here at Acton, um, and the idea that people get together for non-economic purposes um, it happens all the time, and it happens literally naturally, right? And it's something that you can't manufacture uh, with a policy, you can't replace uh, with a government, um, and trying to do so um, is is not simply a matter of you know oh no you know. It's going to hurt the bottom line of some companies. It's going to threaten the inviolable dignity of the human person. Um, and that's why we're concerned about it here at Acton. And the importance of, the, of, of social institutions is also grounded deeply in Christian theology. Lord, Lord Acton, at the conclusion of his uh, The History of Freedom and Antiquity, talks about that when Christ said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's, those words spoken in his last visit to the temple three days before his death gave to the civil power under the protection of conscience a sacredness it had never enjoyed and bounds it had never acknowledged. And they were the repudiation of absolutism and the inauguration of freedom. For the Lord not only delivered the precept, but created the force to execute it to maintain the necessary immunity in one supreme sphere, to reduce all political authority within defined limits, ceased to be the aspiration of patient reasoners, and was made the perpetual charge and care of the most energetic institution and most universal association in the world. Here he's talking about the church. Mm -hmm. So in Christianity, in particular, you have a social institution created Mm -hmm. to act in the world And uh, it's not merely as important as the theological content is, as important as 
um, as all of those things are. God acts in history, and he yep. acts through institutions. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's important that we recognize that. Yeah, and I, well, and I think this this transitions to the next two very well, also. So, you know, Acton kind of mentions that you have in that statement of Christ the sort of acknowledging of the goodness of government, the the, the real need for it, um, the legitimacy of it. Um, there's a, a contrast there between Christ and uh, the Zealot movement in ancient Israel, which literally viewed Roman taxes as theft um, and was the the cause of at least one um, revolt, uh, which which was a failed revolt. Um, spoiler alert! Uh, and uh, but there was there was a, a thought that the Christ should be someone like this, at least among some people. Uh, and Jesus Jesus did not uh, line up behind that kind of ideology. On the other hand, he doesn't say, hey, the Romans are, are great. Uh, in fact, he, he diminishes them. Yeah, at the same time, he acknowledges their legitimacy. Uh, he says, this is not the most important thing. Um, you know, uh, he's specifically talking about the Roman coin uh, and whose image is on the coin. Well, Caesar's image is on the coin. So give, give Caesar his coin, right? Uh, but as we've been talking, uh, God's image is on you is on us, is on human persons. Uh, so give to God what is God's means give God everything. And yeah, give Caesar his coin. Like, <laughs> you know, so there's there's a, a incredible, uh, just the, the depth of the wisdom, I mean, not surprisingly, um, coming from our Lord, uh, is is amazing in that, that very passage. And you see throughout history a sort of chastened understanding among Christians of human government. So even when... When Constantine comes along, you know, you had this transition of, you mentioned like um, ancient Egypt and the pharaohs. Well, the pharaohs were considered gods, right? They were like literally gods on earth or, you know, at least representatives of the sun god or something like that. Um, Same thing was true eventually uh, in ancient Rome that as soon as they had emperors, uh, usually after their death, um, but sometimes during their life, uh, there was this understanding of this apotheosis of the emperor. Um, Sometimes it was very very interestingly instituted by the Senate. So literally they died and then everybody voted and said, okay, they're a god, uh, which is a whole weird perspective and be fun to explore, but a little, little tangential. But, um, but there was a cult of the emperor that, that built up around this. It was um, the, the refusal of Christians to participate in this cult was often uh, the cause of persecution uh, during the time of pagan Rome. Uh, and when Constantine became a Christian, uh, while he didn't necessarily end the cult in terms of uh, paying honor, he basically gutted it of its religious significance because he he refused to acknowledge any deity of any human emperor of any of any person or of himself for that matter. Um, now he still did a lot of dirty things as emperor. You know, it didn't didn't stop government from being government or politicians from being politicians. Um, but we see we see a very different perspective than what you had in ancient Rome, where it was. Rome and Caesar over everything. You know, Caesar is Lord was the saying, whereas Christians said that Christ is Lord. Um, to the point where you get uh, the Emperor Theodosius. Um, there was a, an uprising or a revolt uh, of some kind in Thessaloniki, um, and he ordered soldiers to go and put it down. Um, yeah, maybe actually to be charitable, there was a protest is what there was. Um, and he tried to recall the soldiers having second thoughts about it, but it was too late. Maybe maybe he was purposefully too late. I'm not really sure. But people were killed um, because the soldiers showed up and, and they just did whatever they could to try to quell uh, the protest. Uh, and so then he goes to Milan where he has a residence. The emperor had a residence in Milan. There's a bishop there named St. Ambrose. Uh, and Theodosius shows up and tries to go to church. And Ambrose stands at the door and doesn't let him in says, you need to do penance. You need to repent of what you did. Um, and to his credit, despite the massacre he committed, Theodosius submits to this. Um, and so once again, it very vividly illustrates this distinction between church and state, uh, between you know where do you draw the lines of authority and of, of moral value. Um, and you see this in very imperfect ways, but you, you continue to see this in the Roman Empire and in the Byzant, you know, the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, the Emperor Justinian uh, talks about a symphonia between church and state. Now, that might make us a little uncomfortable about how close uh, church and state work together, but it was still once again acknowledging um, that God has ordained the church as a different institution apart from the state uh, that has its own calling and role in society, and it has its own domain 
uh, you know, to use the, the language of spheres, the kind of Abraham Kuyper language that is in this description, uh, it's its own sphere and it's sovereign in that own sphere. Um, and yes, it should work together with the state uh, to promote the common good. Um, but there, there are boundary lines that the state uh, to cross them has violated once again, you know, this, this dignity of human persons and, and their social institutions. And so that leads us to not only God's action in history, but human action mattering as much as well. And that's our next principle, that human persons are by nature acting persons. Uh, through human action, the person can actualize his potential by freely choosing the moral goods that fulfill his nature. Uh, what this is to say is basically it's not a matter of fatalism. To say that providence is real and that God works with people means that God does not also violate our dignity as free people created in his image. You know, not only is God free, but he makes us free. Um, and that, not to push too hard here, but that, that gets us then to the next one, which is sin. Um, people make bad decisions all the time. Um, and again, we saw, you know, you see this in ancient Rome uh, with Constantine, with Theodosius, with really every emperor. You know, you're not going to find this. Um, you find this with a lot of bishops too, for that matter. Um, but all, although human beings in their created nature are good, in their current state, they are fallen and corrupted by sin. Uh, and that makes the state necessary to restrain evil, right? We need laws against theft and against murder and against, you know, all these sorts of things. And we need some sort of institutional apparatus to enforce those laws. That's the state. That's what it does. Uh, it writes laws, it executes laws, and it makes judgments uh, based on um, you know, whether or not those laws have been violated and what an appropriate punishment is. Um, it has this, this essential function of uh, justice in the world. And understanding human persons in this way as having this, on the one hand, unlimited potential for good, but on the other hand, this corrupted and flawed state of being that we find ourselves ought to chasten what we expect government to be able to do, what we expect anything, anything yes. man-made to be able to do for that matter. And one of my favorite quotes uh, is from actually the Desert Fathers. Uh, Abba Piman uh, says, if a man makes a new heaven and a new earth, he still cannot be safe from temptation. Uh, the idea being that this is not all up to us. Once again, it is this this relationship, this uh this co-working with God um, that is ideal, that it's it's God acting in history and human beings acting in history, and things go right when human beings are acting with God, and they go wrong when they're not. What What's, what's interesting is that um, this is acknowledged in a wide variety of religious traditions. Yes. Not always in the same exact theological language, and you'll notice in that description of sin, there's a lot theologically that goes – that various confessions, mm -hmm. different religious traditions would acknowledge that's not addressed in that. Mm -hmm. And that's because this is this is intentionally broad and this is particularly talking about the social context. Um, you could have a belief as 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 devout Hindus do that the that the root klesa or the or the, or the, or the root affliction of mankind is ignorance, mm -hmm. which is a very different vision of what sin is in a Christian context, but it's very similar in its social implications. Hmm. Um, and even, even you know, uh, Frank Knight, famous eco economist, yeah. um, you know, not, not an orthodox religious person by any stretch, maybe perhaps not religious at all, although, although there's, there's interesting history in there, yeah. um, you know, talks about how uh, the man is not the social animal he pretends to be. But an antisocial animal, a moralizing animal, a disagreeable animal, an opinionated animal, conceited, prejudiced, dogmatic, and addicted to regard his opinions as sacred and absolute. And, you know, G.K. Chesterton used to say that this was, you know, the, the only empirically verifiable Christian doctrine right. was original sin. <laughs> um, and, and this is sort of widely acknowledged. Um, and you touched on how this limits government. And this gets us to our next mm -hmm. sort of uh, sort of principle, which is the, the rule of law and the subsidiary role of government. And that government's primary responsibility is to promote the common good, to maintain the rule of law, and to preserve basic duties and human rights. The government's role is not to usurp free actions, but to minimize those conflicts that may arise when the free actions of persons and social institutions result in competing interests. Mm -hmm. uh, the state should exercise this responsibility according to the principle of subsidiarity. This principle has two components. First, 
Jurisdictionally, broader institutions must refrain from usurping power and proper functions that should be performed by the person institutions more immediate to him. Second, that jurisdictionally broader institutions should assist individual persons and institutions more immediate to the person only when the latter cannot fulfill their proper functions. This is a very delicate balance. Yes, but I think it's it's incredibly healthy. It comes from, uh, at least it was first stated, although you can find the idea um, going back much farther, but uh, first stated in Quadragesimo Anno, um, uh, the uh, Annus, uh, the uh, encyclical, uh, the, uh, the papal encyclical, in which it talks about that this actually increases the power of the state, which is somewhat paradoxical, uh, this limitation of the state. Uh, but the idea being that not only does is there a concern of free institutions of society, so the family, right? The state should not be punishing my kids when they disobey. That's my job, right? Um, I have to discipline them. I have to teach them uh, how to behave. And there's all kinds of things that happen in a household um, that are just a matter of like kids learning how to be social, uh, that we do not want the state to try and do. In fact, the state is ill-equipped to do. Um, and you can go from there. We have we have city governments, we have counties, we have states, we have the federal government. So there's different layers to things. And on the one hand, sometimes they prove inadequate. So sometimes there's like, a, say, a natural disaster. You know, a hurricane hits the Gulf Coast. Um, states have their own, you know, uh, rescue services and whatnot. But sometimes they got to call in the federal government. They need they need that extra help. They need uh, the National Guard or whoever to come in um, and and bring food and supplies, rescue people who are stranded. Um, that's a, a great example of the subsidiary role of government. Um, that sometimes these lower institutions do need help, and it is in fact the the duty of higher institutions to help. Um, so it goes both ways, right? It's a limiting principle, but it's also uh, a rationale, and not in a not in a, a cynical sense, but a, a legitimate reason why governments exist and why they they do need to be involved. Um, sometimes in the the more specific details of a particular community. Yep, and. Only when the latter could not fulfill yes. its functions. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's important because if you resort to that too much, mm -hmm. you atrophy mm -hmm. those, those, those responsibilities carried out by other institutions. Mm -hmm. If at every turn your child misbehaves, the state comes in to address the problem, you're not able to grow as a parent. You're right. not able to grow in wisdom. Mm -hmm. That is um, – and, and this is something, you know, every time uh, a, a government organization, let's say every time, you know, a national government gets into economic trouble and the IMF comes in and they've got, you know, a barrage of economic aid conditioned on all these policy changes. Well, it's all of a sudden that government is all of a sudden not able to discharge its natural duties mm -hmm. and it's not able to correct its own mistakes and um, it's not able to serve its proper function. Well, and this applies not only to governments, but to all social institutions. So um, it's not an uncommon complaint sometimes uh, for people to want their church to have a better Sunday school program. Um, and churches should have great Sunday school programs for kids. I, you know, it's a wonderful uh, vocation for anyone who's willing to take up that struggle. Uh, but if parents aren't praying with their kids, it doesn't matter how great of a youth program your church has because the kids are going to see it in their home. There's a duty in the home that really cannot be replaced uh, for religious upbringing and for moral formation, um, even by a religious and moral institution like the church. Um, in the same sort of way, people expect things from schools all the time that maybe are not realistic uh, to expect teachers or principals or administrators or curricula to be able to handle. Um, and, and so there's, there's this limiting, yeah, it's great when there's, there's say, you know, a counselor at school who can help a kid from a troubled home. You know, that, that's an example of that stepping in when there's a failed, more, more immediate, proximate institution. Um, but that's not the ideal. You know, people can't be raised by their school counselor. Um, most of us did not find school counselor's advice to be very helpful <laughs> uh, in, in a wide array of things, although I will, I will speak well on my own. Um, but uh, this principle goes far beyond simply government. It's not just like a, a baptizing of, 
you know, American conservative small government politics. Uh, it's much bigger than that. It's about an understanding of the nature of society and the nature of different social spheres and how what their duties are to one another and what their rights and freedoms are. And it gets us right back to the dignity of the human person because all of this is about rights and responsibilities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and engaging people to participate in both. Um, and w one of the ways we do that is, is through the creation of wealth. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is our next uh, principle, is that you know material impoverishment undermines the conditions that allow people to flourish. That the best means of reducing poverty is to protect private property rights through the rule of law. This allows people to enter into voluntary exchange circles in which to express their creative nature. Wealth is created then when human beings creatively transform matter into resources, because human beings can create wealth. Economic exchange need not be zero sum. Yes, um, and this is this is a way of of concretely utilizing your own freedom and responsibility to transform your communities for good, to render service to others, mm -hmm. and for others to be able to support you and encourage you in that. Mm -hmm. This is the the huge huge insight of Adam Smith in his book, which is the full title, which is a. Um, Nature and Inquiry into the Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Oh, sorry. That's probably not a <laughs> perfectly accurate title, but it's something along those lines. Anyway, um, but he's, he's asking the question, where does wealth come from? And even though there are a few things that economists have, have built upon and improved upon uh, from Smith's theory, uh, his basic insight uh, was really world-changing, and rightly so, is the idea that when you have the division of labor. So you take a task, you break it up into its component parts, you're able to more efficiently produce. Um, and then uh, you go to market and people say, well, I will trade you this for that, right? And the, the implication being, I would rather have this than that. And if the other person makes a deal, they'd rather have that than this. Uh, so both people consider themselves better off. Now, it's not just the exchange that created the wealth. It's the ability to produce things more efficiently, to produce more with less work, uh, with less resources, um, whether it be material resources or human resources, for that matter. Uh, that This is created wealth, and it affects everything. So if you increase the supply of... Uh, you know, Nutrigrain bars or whatever, uh, the price goes down, which means that let's say that it's like a superfood and it's what everyone should should actually eat. Uh, I, I'm not being paid by the Nutrigrain bar company uh, or anything like that, but just as a hypothetical, your super bars, we'll just use a fake name. Um, let's say super bars are the perfect food, but they're really expensive to produce. And then somebody comes up with a way uh, to divide up the process of making them that makes it efficient. Well, now the price drops because you can just pump out a thousand when it would have in the same time you would have only been able to make ten, um, and so the same amount of resources, or maybe not necessarily the same amount of resources materially, but uh, in terms of time, in terms of human effort, uh, is producing so much more that when you bring it to market, well now the price drops and everyone has access to this. So wealth is not just a matter of you know GDP or. Uh, stock price worth, uh, and not to say that you know stock values have no value of their own or anything like that, but it's a, wealth is about human welfare, uh, the bottom line. Um, and yes, it, it tends to be more material welfare, but but not exclusively so. Um, and it tends to actually get at much deeper things than you know the the number in someone's bank account. It's it's are they, are you being provided for? Are your basic needs being met? Um, are you able to actually enjoy some leisure time uh, to reflect to spiritually develop? Um, all these things are a matter in economic terms of the wealth of nations. Um, and it, from our perspective, that it, this is what is what makes the creation of wealth so important. It's not a zero sum proposition, meaning that when I buy that super bar from the store, I pay them my money, they give me the super bar. Um, it's not that I have lost and they have gained. We both gained. Uh, that's what makes it positive sum. Um, and that's, that's so hard to get a handle on. There are many incredibly intelligent people 
in the history of the world have always presumed that one person's gain means another person's loss. Um, and Smith's insights uh, and the insights of others who have built upon him and some who have come before him was that that is not the case in economic exchange, that it is this positive sum exchange. And uh, this has had immeasurable impact, even though people try to measure it all the time, but immeasurable impact on human well-being and human flourishing in the last 200 years. And this gets us into the next, which calls us back again to previous ones. It's amazing how integrated a lot of these are. Yeah. Because there's an institutional context. There is a result of that inquiry in Smith mm -hmm. where there is a certain institutional context that allows that to flourish, that allows – the creation of wealth, and there are other institutional contexts that don't. Mm -hmm. um, that hockey stick, that amazing rise in human welfare, for the vast majority of human history, that wasn't the case. Right. Uh, for the vast majority of human history, there wasn't the institutional context to allow this to, over a series of generations, happen. Um, and that institutional context provides for our next uh, core principle, which is economic liberty. And this, this is, in a positive sense, is achieved by fulfilling one's nature as a person by freely choosing to do what we ought. Economic liberty is a species of liberty so stated. As such, the bearer of economic liberty not only has certain rights but also duties. Mm -hmm. An economically free person, for example, must be free to enter a market voluntarily. Hence, those who have the power to interfere with the market are duty-bound to remove any artificial barrier to entry in the market and also to protect private property and shared property rights. But the economically free person will also bear the duty to others to participate in the market as a moral agent, as they act in any other mm -hmm. context, and in accordance with moral goods. Therefore, the law must guarantee private property rights and voluntary exchange. Um, this gets back uh, Walter Eucken, and yeah. you've written about Eucken before. Yeah. He's a German economist, and he has a great way of thinking about that institutional context for economic liberty that touches on many things addressed in the language of that, uh, of that core principle. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Eucken, uh, he had a great way of just trying to classify any given market. Uh, he said, well, you can have either monopolized supply or demand – um, oligopolized supplier demand or competitive or um, open, or not actually open is the wrong word, but competitive or you know free ish uh, supplier demand. We'll just say um, um, you know, multiplicity of suppliers or demanders and any combination of those. So if you manage, and he actually even subdivided those into like partial monopoly and partial oligopoly, but uh, you can just reduce it to you know three columns and three rows, right? So you have any combination of you could have like a monopolized supply but competitive demand or, you know, so many people wanting one thing but only one person providing that thing or one one company or whatever the case may be. Um, but on top of all of these, so these are actually really helpful just for figuring out what are the dynamics happening in a given market. But on top of all of these, he said markets are either open or closed or partially open or partially closed or whatever the case may be. Um, and this is far more important. We see this in a lot of economists and we, we see it right here in uh, this core principle that the real the, – the most important issue is what are the barriers to entry to a market? That is what determines whether a market is free or not. Uh, and the term free markets is often – thrown around and politicized, uh, whether positively or negatively, sometimes with no real connection to that actual definition. But what this means is, is everyone having that opportunity to show up and to be creative uh, and to provide or to um, purchase uh, the things that they need, uh, the things that other people need. Um, uh, I love uh, the definition of uh, the Reform theologian Lester de Coster. Uh, they said, work uh, is the form in which we make ourselves useful to each other, right? It, it is is a way of serving one another. That's that's what we do with our labor. Um, if it were just self serving, well, we'd all be working on our little subsistence farm somewhere. But that would not be able to sustain a population of like eight or nine billion people that we have on the planet. The reason why we ha successfully have so many people on the planet is because we're all helping each other out, and we largely do that through our work and through economic exchange, and um, ideally through free economic exchange. Uh, I also like that we we hear in this principle uh, Acton's definition of of the true what he called the Catholic notion of liberty. That is not simply uh, the freedom to do what we like, but the right to do what we ought. Uh, so we don't presume 
Uh, the economic liberty means, therefore, people should be able to show up and do whatever they want in a market, and the government should just stay out of it. The government has a role, uh, as already mentioned, uh, in restraining evil. So people show up, and they're hurting other people. Um, the government has a role to stop it, right? So, so free, free markets and economic liberty doesn't mean that there's no role for government. Uh, it needs to uphold contracts that are freely made. It needs to uh, guarantee private property rights so people actually have the autonomy to decide to do uh, what they want with the resources uh, that they own. Um, but it also needs to restrain evil. Um, anytime there's there's deception or fraud or um, or if the nature of the market itself, um, although this, this can be debated by some people, but um, if the nature of the market itself, let's say, um, you, you decide you want to get in the big business of human organ harvesting, right? Um, people might voluntarily sign up for that, but they might voluntarily sign up for that basically out of duress because they're so poor they don't see another option. That doesn't mean the market should exist. Um, there are better ways to help the poor. Um, and there are better ways to get organ donations for that matter, uh, or at least more moral ways, maybe not more efficient ways. Uh, some economists would, would argue otherwise. But... Uh, but there are things like that. There, are, there, are, and those are not necessarily uh, always clear um, what the proper moral stance is. But that there is a moral stance, I think, is undisputed. Um, and so there, there is a role for government in regulating markets. Uh, we at the Act Institute actually believe that we're not anarchists, uh, at least not total anarchists. I guess it depends on who you talk to. But, uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but we aren't. Uh, we we think that economic liberty uh, is not simply institutional, not simply economic uh, or material or monetary, but moral. There's a moral dimension to it, an essentially moral dim dimension to it, and that when we leave out that moral dimension, we once again are failing to honor the dignity of the human person who is not simply created free, but created responsible uh, with duties attached to our rights. That's a great way of putting it. And so there's there's this there's this subject of moral order, mm -hmm. and this gets us to our, our next, which is because there's there's also economic value, mm -hmm. which the consensus among economists that we embrace is that economic value is subjective, mm -hmm. uh, because its existence depends on it being felt by this by the subject themselves. Economic value is the significance that a subject attaches to a thing whenever he perceives a causal connection between this thing and the satisfaction of a present urgent want. The subject may be wrong in his value judgment by attributing value to a thing that will not or cannot satisfy his present urgent want. The truth of economic value judgments is settled just in case that thing can satisfy the expected want. While this does not imply the realization of any other sort of value, something can have both a subjective economic value and an objective moral value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Because you've got individual conscience mm -hmm. on the one hand. It's essential, it's essential for us to be free, to exercise our moral duties as, mm -hmm. as we see them, to fulfill those roles of conscience. It's good for that conscience to be formed, to be under some authority. Um, but all of us in every circumstance – aren't going to be doing the same thing. We right. all live in particular contexts mm -hmm. and we need that economic liberty and we all experience that that subjective value in economics differently. That's part of what makes exchange possible mm -hmm. is the fact that there is a way in which I could trade you something that I don't value for something that I do value and we could both wind up with things that are more valuable to each other. So this underlies a lot of that logic of exchange. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not – that acknowledging that reality is not a commitment to moral relativism right, right. or to a notion that everything can be bought and sold. Yeah, this is a, another hard distinction uh, to grasp, just like the idea of economic um, activity, production and exchange not being zero sum but being positive sum. Economic value is uh, distinct from moral value doesn't mean that there's never any overlap. But economic value is just simply about the judgment that individual persons make of how much something is worth to them. Um, and that's going to vary, and people can be wrong. Um, so I think a great example 
Um, for some reason, I'm stuck on food. We're recording this before lunch, so. <laughs> but uh, but my my four year old, as of this recording, thinks that all he needs to eat is snacks, like just like all carbs all the time, uh, and it is it is a struggle to get him to eat vegetables and meat, right? Um, and so his subjective valuation is that what really matters to him is like Cheez-Its and like goldfish crackers and whatever. Um, now, my job as his dad is to make him eat the right stuff, right? <laughs> Sometimes I wish the government could do it for me, but uh, but I, that's not, not how things are. Um, I have to do it for him. Now, we may look at that and we say, okay, but that's a kid. That's not somebody going to market, whatever. Okay, fine. Uh, but let's go back to the super bars. Let's say that they are everything that the body needs, but they don't really taste very good. Um, I would bet a lot of people are just going to get a chocolate bar instead of the super bar, even though they know better. Or maybe maybe they don't know better. They just say, oh, I like the taste of this one better, right? Um, it is not anybody's responsibility but that individual to make the right choice. Um, this does not make chocolate bars wrong. They're a wonderful treat uh, on the right occasion, right? Uh, but you can't subsist on them. Uh, you're going to have all kinds of health problems. Um, and so in the same way... Uh, there is a subjective value of what I want to spend my money on or what I want to spend my, my time and my resources on to be uh, a bit more general. Again, it's not just about money. Um, but then there's the question of, well, whether or not that judgment is always morally right um, is not always something that can just be determined by a, an outside observer. Um, it depends on the particular person in their situation. You know, one buying one chocolate bar may not be unhealthy. Buying a chocolate bar is my only meal, three meals a day, seven days a week, is unhealthy, right? So the, the result there isn't, oh, we need the government to come in and stop the sale of chocolate bars, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, no, I need to make better decisions um, as, as a human person, as a citizen, as a market actor. Um, so we have a subjective value of what the chocolate bar means to me in terms of the resources I want to give to obtaining it. Um, and for that matter, what the chocolate bar company wants to spend in producing it. But on the other hand, we have the moral value um, of, of that given market item. Um, and that you can extend that to anything, not just chocolate bars and hypothetical super bars or kids eating their vegetables or not, or whatever the case may be. But there's, there's a real distinction. Um, I think we see this in the art world all the time. This is a good uh, parallel that, although there's really interesting and things I don't necessarily understand. I'm not like a professional art critic or anything like that, but people produce art and then it, it gets sold for like a million dollars. And everyone says, that's so ugly. How could it have sold for that much money, right? Uh, and what they're confusing is aesthetic value, which is another kind of value. And so artistic value um, and economic value. Somebody looked at it and said, this is worth my million dollars. And so they bought it. So how much is it worth? It's worth a million dollars, at least to that person. Now, is it contributing to mankind's uh, interaction with beauty uh, in some aesthetic, meaningful way? Well, that can be debated apart from the question of however much money somebody paid for it. The, these two things are not the same. Um, and there is no obligation for anyone to try to force them to be the same. In fact, trying to do so uh, would itself be a form of tyranny because you're, you're basically trying to confuse two categories, fit a square peg into a round hole, um, going around saying this is what ought to be done for you. If the person had a million dollars, they wanted to spend it on a really boring painting, well, it was their million dollars to spend. Maybe that was a bad decision. Maybe it was a good decision. Who knows? Um, that's not anybody else's responsibility to judge than the individual person who makes that purchase. Which gets us back to the nature of the human person. Yeah. And which, you know, Lord Acton uh, writes about conscience a lot. And he says that our conscience exists and acts for ourselves. It exists in each of us. It is limited by the conscience of others. It is enough for oneself, not for another. It respects the conscience of others. Therefore, it tends to restrict authority and enlarge liberty. It's the law of self-government. And this is something... Oh, this, all of us are called. There's another do. quote. I don't know if you have it, but another quote from Acton, very related, where he talks about it's better to follow an erring conscience 
uh, than to learn to ignore one's conscience. All right, sometimes we're not right in our moral judgments or even in our moral intuitions to, to speak more of conscience because uh, conscience needs to be formed by our communities, by um, our families, our churches, by our culture. But to learn to ignore our conscience uh, is going to lead us to have no convictions, right, rather than wrong convictions. And he'd rather people, and I think he's right, rather people try to do the right thing as they best know how and listen to their conscience when it's reproving them than to ignore it. And when people try to supplant another person's conscience for their own moral judgment, that's exactly what they're encouraging in society. They're encouraging people to ignore their conscience. Um, now, there are limits. Again, conscience limits conscience, according uh, to Acton, as you just said. Um, and, they, you know, if somebody is very, very mistaken and their conscience says they should be out doing something terrible to somebody else. Yeah, there's even a, a role for the government, uh, for the law and, um, and everything to step in and do something about that and other communities for that matter. Um, but uh, there is there is this moral core um, and this this idea of uh, human action once again that that people have a responsibility to act morally as best they know um, and that involves following their conscience. In the Bhagavad Gita, there's a there's a there's a verse about how um, it is it's it's the worst thing to appropriate someone else's dharma, somebody else's duty to mm. usurp that from themselves, which gets to this very, yeah. very sort of point. So again, you've got, you've got a broad array of, of religious perspectives mm -hmm. that inform this. And when we talked about consciences being formed and we talked about that, that brings us sort of to our last mm -hmm. um, uh, core principle, which is that the priority of culture, that liberty flourishes in a society supported by a moral culture that embraces the truth about the transcendent origin and destiny of the human person. The moral culture leads to harmony and to the proper ordering of a society, while the various institutions within their political, economic, or other spheres are important. The family is the primary inculcator of a moral culture in society. Mm. This is what drives everything. This is what shapes human consciences, mm -hmm. which informs our action, both mm -hmm. in the economic sphere and every other one. And it's near, it's nurtured from birth mm -hmm. in the smallest context, in the family context. Mm -hmm. And that radiates out in its influence. Mm -hmm. So when people despair, you know, there are a lot of problems in the world. Sure. They're just, there are. Right. There are. Um, we can debate as to whether there are more problems now than there were at a certain other date and time. But there is no question that we are sort of in all sorts of social crises. And a lot of people wonder, what do I do in that context? Where, uh, you know, and they'll reach for political ideologies mm -hmm. or they'll demonize other persons. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things to keep in mind is uh, you find this again and again, at least in, in Christian tradition, of um, because God made us free, uh, he tries to persuade us rather than coerce us, right? Because to coerce is to take the place of someone's freedom. Now, sometimes that's necessary in terms of law, you know, as we've already mentioned, um, but that's not ideal. You can't sustain a society with coercion. Uh, and it's been tried, uh, frankly. You know, look at uh, the Soviet Union, which did not succeed. Look at places like communist China, which is a place where people live in fear of their social rating, <laughs> you know, as viewed by the government. Uh, or places like North Korea, where it's frankly impossible to even tell um, what the well-being of the average person is because so much is under government control um, and supervision that our conscience gets formed uh, within these institutions of culture. And it, again, it it's, it's, it's a matter of persuasion. And so I think a great historical example, this is where I was, I was trying to get to uh, and trying to remember, is is temperance societies. So in the United States in the 19th century, this was a big deal. There were people that would get together. Um, it was their own sorts of, you know, voluntary societies, um, a lot of women's groups, um, although not, not at all exclusively. Um, and they were trying to encourage people to lay off the booze, <laughs> frankly. Um, they wanted, but th for very good good ends, right? They wanted healthier home lives. Um, they wanted less domestic abuse, um, 
And and not all of them were abolitionist. Um, some of them were just, oh, you need to be more moderate, whatever. Um, but eventually that morphed into a political movement. And what it led to was prohibition in the United States, which is just like the classic example of a policy failure. Um, because what did it lead to? Well, just a giant black market, um, organized crime, bootlegging, all this sort of stuff. Um, and it shows there are just clear limits that even if we want to take the position that these people were right, that people should not drink any alcohol, um, this is not the means to achieve it. Their original, uh, their original self-conception of we are going to persuade people was right. This is how they were actually affecting the most change. And instead, they abdicated that duty to a law, in fact, to an amendment to the Constitution. Um, and what did it result in? Really, a, a culture of violence. Um, now, may have also helped a few homes <laughs> in cases of people that didn't want to join the mob. Um, it doesn't mean that there was no positive outcomes if, you know, you want to get into the details. Um, but I think I think it's at once, you know, we always use it as a bad example. But if we, you just go a little bit back farther in time, you can also see it as a good example uh, that they were trying to persuade. They were trying to build a culture. Um, like, imagine if it was like, uh, hey, I'm going out tonight. Where are you going? Oh, I got a temperance society meeting. <laughs> right? Like that sort of thing doesn't happen now. You know, people are concerned no, about it, all it, sorts it, of. It very much. This is where it precisely <laughs> happens now. Is it happens okay. in the AA meeting? Oh yeah. Well, it okay. Yes, yes, yes. Certainly, certainly. People do transform yes. their lives. But in people terms of like, people mentor others. It's not as popular, you know, as like going out to the club. Is is I guess what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, not to say there were no clubs in the 19th century, but. Um, but yes, oh yes, we certainly have uh, these institutions, and, and they are and they are very good. Um, but the same sort of thing, I think a lot of times people see uh, whatever their their perspective is, they see, oh, you know, everything's going bad in society, and these are the things that I think are problems. My question is always, okay, well, what are you going to do about it, right? Instead of saying somebody else needs to do something about it, or somebody else needs to make somebody else do something about it, you know, the government needs to coerce and force somebody to do something about it, why don't you do something about it? Why don't you form a society? Why don't you start uh, producing material meant to persuade others uh, to come around to your point of view? That, in the long run, I believe, and, and Acton believes, is, is far more effective because uh, it, it acknowledges that priority of culture, uh, that if we want other people to act morally, uh, the way to do that is to affect cultural change uh, and uh to build genuine moral culture, not, you know, hopefully not in a, a kitschy sort of whatever kind of way, but in, in a way that's actually persuasive, in a way that, that people can't ignore. Um, and we see examples of that in history, you know, as I've already mentioned. And that's a way, that's a way you can embrace responsibility. Absolutely. In a way that, you know, and, and, this, is, and this, is, this is precisely why we have our freedom, mm -hmm. is to be able to take that responsibility to invest in our communities and to shape and transform ourselves and the world around us. Dylan, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you, Dan. This was a this was an epic tour of the uh, <laughs> of the core principles and uh, I hope the uh, hope the listeners enjoyed it. Absolutely. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Gabriel Jaja.